Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest. This week, historian and author Max Boot on Ronald Reagan reassessed. There are so many contradictions and dichotomies about Reagan, who was often accused of having simplistic views, but he could be really intensely ideological, and I think more so than most people realized. He was somehow able to draw kind of a a separating line between his rhetoric as a campaigner and his actions in office, where he was very far to the right as a campaigner, but he had actually moved pretty far to the center as both governor and, and, and president. He was often criticized for compromising, and he brushed it off because he said, that's the nature of politics. You have to be realistic about what you can get, and if you're an absolutist, you're not going to get anything done. Max Boot, welcome to Chatter. Good to be here, David. It's great to be talking about this at this time because you have a new massive tome out because you just haven't written enough. You know, three (laughs) books on war, a self-reflection, a biography of Edward Lansdale, and you decided to take on one of the most iconic presidents and write hundreds upon hundreds of pages about the life and legend of Ronald Reagan. You started this back in, what, 2012 or 2013. To the best of your memory, what was on your mind then that drove you to start this? Well, it's pretty simple, really, because it was really just the realization that Reagan was a very consequential, very important president, but there had not been a great biography of him that had been done. So I felt like there was kind of a market opening there. And so I I signed up to do this book. I did not realize quite how much effort it would take, how long it would take, but I, I knew it was going to be a big project, and you know it certainly lived up to that billing. And of course, at the time, this is what, 2013? So this is the Barack Obama presidency. Right. We'd had the Bushes since Reagan as Republican presidents. Trump was on no one's mind other than people who apparently watched television who would see him. But generally was uh, not considered to be someone of importance. So the vibe when you're starting this is very different than when you're completing it and you're putting it into the context of today. How did you tackle this massive project? You did a lot of work on this, including a lot of travel. How did you get your hands around Reagan and, and even get started on doing a full scope biography? Well, it was a daunting prospect for sure. I think, you know, David, the big thing that's actually changed in my mind since 2013 is is my own outlook somewhat, because in 2013, I was a Republican and, you know, it took the changes of the last 10 plus years to wrench me out of my historic affiliation with the Republican Party to become an independent. And I think that's actually been helpful for the biography because, you know, I'm not approaching it as a as a Reagan fanboy. I'm approaching it as a historian who's trying to get the story right. And I think, you know, no longer thinking of myself as a Republican has allowed me to gain greater distance and objectivity on the 40th president. And again, this is not meant to be either a hagiography or a hit job. It's really meant to be a balanced, fair account. And I think, you know, not having kind of a partisan dog in the fight has allowed me to achieve a greater degree of objectivity. But, uh, you know, to answer your other question about how did I wrap my hands around it? It was it was a pretty daunting prospect, I have to say. You know, there were certainly moments throughout this project, especially early on when I was feeling kind of overwhelmed and I was thinking, oh man, there is so much to do. And is there really something new to be said about Ronald Reagan? Because obviously there have been a lot of words written about Ronald Reagan over the course of many, many decades. And eventually I decided, yeah, there's actually a lot more to say about Reagan, but that was only when I got really deep into the research which was basically on two tracks. The first track and the initial track was really oral history interviews because I understood that there was kind of a, a ticking clock. Yeah, you had a clock operating, didn't you? <laughs> right, talking yeah. talking to folks who were close to Reagan. They weren't getting any younger, to put it mildly. And in fact, quite a few of the folks that I talked to early on are no longer with us. You know, folks like George Schultz or Colin Powell or Bud McFarlane, or, or so many others. So I was really lucky to be able to talk to them. And I think I kind of hit a sweet spot because I was far enough removed from the Reagan presidency that I could have some balanced perspective and objectivity on what had happened. 
But there were still a lot of people who knew Reagan well, who were still around, able to talk, and in some ways, maybe talk more frankly than they had in the past, because uh, they had moved so far away from the partisan rancor of the times. So that was kind of my first objective, was to talk to as many people as I could who really knew him. And of course, as I'm sure we'll discuss, finding somebody who quote unquote really knew Reagan it can be a bit of a struggle because a lot of people knew him, but who really knew him? But so anyway, that was one track. The other track was the archival track and going to the Reagan Library primarily to examine the archives, which are also kind of daunting and overwhelming. I know Robert Carroll has spoken about this with his own monumental lifelong LBJ biography, how it doesn't matter how long he spends in the Lyndon Johnson archives and Lyndon Johnson Library, he's never going to see every piece of paper in there. It's just limitless and endless, and you could spend your whole life and, and, and still not read every piece of paper. So that was always also a very daunting thing for me, just sitting in that kind of overly air-conditioned reading room at the Reagan Library in Simi Valley, freezing, even in the California climb, and, you know, just trying to go through as many documents as I could. And frankly, it was just a struggle to concentrate because from having worked in government, I mean, the government just produces so much paperwork and so much of it is just so boring, repetitive, uninteresting, bureaucratic. And so I'm turning page after page, struggling to stay awake because it's really, really boring. And then I'll suddenly light up because there's like, oh, this is like really interesting. And there's something in there that I can really use and that really sheds light on Reagan. But it was definitely a challenge to a, you know, to to read as much as, as I could. And I read thousands of pages, but B, just even to be selective in what I was reading, because again, you can't be indiscriminate. You can't say like, send me every file on Ronald Reagan, because then I would be sitting there 30 years from now. So I had to strategize and think about like, whose files do I want to see? And then, you know, if I see something interesting in one file, then that'll say to me like, oh, maybe I should look at this other person's files and see what's there. And so it was kind of this ongoing archival kind of mystery story or, or investigation. So many questions in all of that. But what was the greatest gem you found in the archives? Because anybody who spends more than a few hours in the archives for any research project, I think has the same experience you did, which is monotony, boredom, taking as many pictures as possible because you can process them later. You can't read them in real time or you'll be there for literally lifetimes. But at some point, you find the gem in my case, it was at the Kennedy Library and looking for intelligence documents and things related to them. I found a note that Jackie had left for John Kennedy that seemingly was being used as a bookmark in his intelligence report that said, can you turn the TV down? Um, <laughs> just And it didn't appear to have been discovered before. Uh, what was the biggest gem you found? Well, there were a lot of gems. It's kind of hard to to choose one. I mean, it was fascinating just to read all of Reagan's personal letters, and that is one file where I read every single thing that was in there, everything that he had handwritten himself and, you know, often later typed up by his secretaries, both as governor and as president, and even when he was out of office. And it was really just fascinating, a great insight into his mind. And he was a beautiful letter writer, which I know will surprise a lot of people, but his letters were always a pleasure to read, and he always found exactly the right words, whether he was expressing sympathy or anger or whatever the emotion was. He always found a very pithy and compelling way to phrase things. And I was also very struck by reading Ronald Reagan's love letters to Nancy, which he carefully saved and box after box. And it wasn't just love letters. It was also like every Thanksgiving, every Easter, every Christmas, every New Year's, every birthday, he would send her a card, a loving card. And he would go out and buy the card and write it up and, and she would save it. And so like decades of cards, decades of love letters, really fascinating insight because, you know, some cynics have suggested that there was something manufactured or kind of made for TV about their relationship. But obviously it was very genuine, deeply heartfelt and went back to the beginnings of their relationship in the early 1950s. So that's just kind of two general categories, but there were also a lot of specific things, like not all of which cast Reagan in a good light. I mean, for example, I remember having an aha moment when I ran across a letter that he'd written, I think it was in 1972, referencing some John Birch Society publications and how he had read them and found them to be very interesting. Well, I don't think anybody's ever reported that Reagan as governor was reading John Birch Society publications. That showed how he was kind of susceptible to crazy conspiracy mongering and 
propaganda. Or in a similar vein, a letter that he received as president from one of his old Hollywood pals in kind of red hunting days in the late 40s from the McCarthyite era. And this pal was telling him that Alan Cranston, Tom Bradley, and Willie Brown, who are all kind of mainstream Democrats in California, were all secret communists who were conspiring to sabotage Robert Bork's nomination of the Supreme Court on orders from Moscow. And this is like Looney Tune stuff, but he received it very politely and seemed to take it under serious advisement. But that actually cast more light on one of his chief associates from Hollywood days than it did on him. There were also, you know, as president, there were fascinating files that I read from one of the few African-American staffers in the White House complaining about how the Reagan administration had alienated African-Americans and how African-Americans just felt ignored and slighted by the president. This was somebody who was a fan of the president, who worked for the president, but was trying to get senior White House officials with relatively little success to pay attention to how they were alienating minority communities. So those are, you know, just three random things that just came to mind. There's like a million other things in there that are equally fascinating. Those are good, though. And they did stand out to me reading the book. You know, it's amazing having read several biographies of Reagan and, you know, spent a lot of time in the archives myself and interviewing folks that I was surprised by many things, in part because this is a full biography and not focused on something narrow like intelligence or even national security. I mean, I think the highest compliment I received on the biography came from Reagan's kids, Ron Reagan and Patty Davis, who have both read the book and told me that not only did they like the book and they thought it was very fair and accurate, but they learned new stuff about their dad from the book, which I take as the highest compliment I can imagine. I mean, imagine learning something about your own parent from a book. Absolutely. One of the things I do want to get to in the substance here is talking about the the image of Reagan, Reagan as an icon in different ways, and how that relates to the actual experiences of Reagan. And one of those stood out to me when I was reading this. I remember John Negroponte, who was Deputy National Security Advisor at the end of the Reagan experience, but had been ambassador and an assistant secretary of state before that. So had pretty intense experiences with Reagan in those last couple of years. And he told me that he never heard Reagan use profanity and that the idea of using profanity in front of the president was also just verboten. And yet you found moments, you found times when Reagan did and just how much that stands out. So it's almost the exception that proves the rule that he was a very um, almost polite, genteel person. He was very personable face to face uh, to the extreme that he avoided profanity most of the time. But when he used it, it, it really meant something. And, and that that comes off the page in a way that does get to the personal and the image side of it really well. That's one of many fascinating aspects of him. And if you read his diary, he would not even spell out mild curse words like hell and damn. He would do he would do the first and last letters and then not fill in what's in, in the middle because yeah. he thought this would be offensive. And, but you're right. He did occasionally curse. He certainly got mad occasionally. And this was actually something I asked a lot of people about. This was actually one of the questions I kept asking. You know, obviously, Reagan was a very mild-mannered, very low-key person uh, who seldom flew off the handle. But have you ever seen him get mad or, like, really furious about something? And that would often produce, you know, a very interesting answer about what really got him exercised. For example, I just remember in 1976 when he was running against Gerald Ford for the Republican nomination and one of Ford's chief strategist was Reagan's former strategist, Stu Spencer, who was one of, also one of my best sources, I would add, for the book. And I remember hearing about how Spencer, working for Ford, put up a very effective campaign commercial, basically suggesting that Reagan as president, if he becomes president, could be a warmonger and raising you know questions about his fitness to be commander in chief. And that was one where Reagan did get pretty teed off and, you know, it was like pounding the bulkhead of the airplane and just furious that Spencer had done that to him. So there were not many examples of him losing his temper, but the ones that were out there were certainly telling. Right on. So your research obviously took you to California many, many, many times, but also to Iowa, where he had been working as a broadcaster 
You had interviews with people all over the country in person, and I'm assuming by telephone and Zoom as well. But interestingly, probably the most interesting place you visited, I will say, must have been Bloomington Normal, Illinois, because that's where I'm from. And Adam <laughs> Kinzinger also, by the way, grew up there. But you told me years ago that you were visiting when you were doing an Illinois, Iowa trip, that you were going to Bloomington Normal to check out a it barely shows up in the book because you did your research and you found there wasn't a story to tell. But what was the angle involving Reagan as a young man, a testosterone laden man? What was the story that you were trying to chase down in central Illinois? Well, there was a previous Reagan biographer had claimed that Reagan's high school and college girlfriend, Margaret Cleaver, had been secretly impregnated by the Gipper and then had left college at Eureka College to give up the baby for uh, adoption, and mm -hmm. uh, that this was what she was actually doing instead of spending a year at the University of Illinois, as she claimed to be doing, having transferred from Eureka College. And I just could not find anything to substantiate that story. Uh, and in fact, there's a lot of substantiation the other way, including pictures of her in the University of Illinois yearbook and uh, pretty clear indications that she actually was attending the University of Illinois. But these are the kind of things that, that you know, I tried very hard to track down. I just love the fact that as a biographer, this is the kind of thing you couldn't have done, even if you worked full time on this book for two or three years, you, you could not have gone to check out the home for orphaned children or whatever it was in a remote town in Illinois, just to check to see if they had any records that might be relevant. But when you spend this much time, you can actually chase it down and do that. So you mentioned when, when you started this, it was just because Reagan is a fascinating figure for many different reasons, and you weren't satisfied with the biographies that you saw. In the course of writing it, you at some point developed a, a sense of the framing, and the framing comes out very clearly in the final product, which is Reagan was both an ideologue, but also uh, and, and perhaps more often uh, a pragmatist, that he had his ideas and they would drive him. But when it came to decisions, when it came to key turning points, he almost always chose the pragmatic way. And this goes across decades of his life. Uh, it's a powerful frame that doesn't come across clearly to me in any of the other biographies I've read. When did this frame hit you? Was it early in the research that you noticed that this was a guiding principle? Or was it as you're drafting it, and that then becomes the vehicle to take it over that final speed bump to publication? I'm not really sure, because I really did not start off with a thesis beyond the very general idea that there was not a good biography of Ronald Reagan. But in terms of who Reagan was, or, or if what was going to be new about my research, didn't really know, because it was really driven by the research. It was I mean, some books start off with a thesis and then you find substantiation for that thesis. This was kind of the opposite. It was like, it was just driven by curiosity. And then it was a question of figuring out who was Reagan and what did I want to say about him. And I, I really don't know when this, this theme emerged, but it certainly emerged in the course of my research as I was trying to make sense of what I was learning. And, you know, there are so many contradictions and dichotomies about Reagan, who was often accused of having simplistic views, but certainly was not a simple man or was kind of deceptively complicated. He looked simple on the surface, but there was a lot underneath the surface. And But so I think this is one of the core contradictions of Reagan or one of the core realities that you have to struggle with as a Reagan biographer is that he could be really intensely ideological. And I think more so than most people realized because most of us tend to remember him as president when he was moving more to the center. But there was a previous Reagan who was very, very t far to the right in the late 50s, early 60s, and, and even into the 70s, where he was often repeating John Birch Society conspiracy theories, accusing Democrats of leading America to communism, suggesting that Medicare and Medicaid would lead to the destruction of freedom in America, opposing civil rights laws like the 1964 Civil Rights Act or the 1965 Voting Rights Act, kind of winking at white bigots with phrases about law and order and welfare queens and states' rights and all the rest. There were real reasons why, when he was elected governor and, and especially president, a lot of liberals thought, wow, this is really scary. This guy can blow up the world. He can do horrible things. He's going to 
cast widows and orphans into the snow. It's going to be this this horrible right wing hellscape, basically. That was kind of the the fear that many had, and. In office, he acted in ways that were very much counter to those perceptions, such that, again, some of the more fascinating interviews I had was just asking Jerry Brown, the former governor of California, Willie Brown, the former speaker of the California Assembly, what did they think of Reagan as governor? And they both told me he was actually a pretty good governor. He was he was actually pretty centrist. And by comparison, a lot of right-wingers in California were very frustrated with Reagan as governor and thought... You know, he was some kind of Manchurian candidate, had sold them out, was not acting as they expected. And there was, you know, a lot of repetition of that when he became president as well, where, and this is something that a lot of conservatives don't want to remember today, but one of the consistent themes of his presidency was that conservatives kept accusing Ronald Reagan of being a sellout, in particular in foreign policy, where they never thought he was tough enough on the Soviet Union. And I uncovered this kind of amusing 1982 op-ed in the New York Times from Norman Pothor, it's the editor of Commentary. You know, the title was Why Neocons Are So Disappointed with the Reagan Foreign Policy, which is kind of ironic because, of course, today conservatives think that Ronald Reagan was the gold standard of foreign policy and everything else. But the reality was, if you actually look at the historical record and not succumb to kind of the nostalgia that, that surrounds Reagan, the reality was... He had actually moved pretty far to the center as both governor and, and, and president, doing things like raising taxes, as governor signing a very liberal abortion law, as president cutting deals with Tip O'Neill and Mikhail Gorbachev, all these things that were huge disappointments to a lot of conservatives. But that was who Reagan was. So he was somehow able, and this is, one, I think, one of the central mysteries of Ronald Reagan, he was somehow able to draw kind of a a separating line between his rhetoric as a campaigner and and a speaker and his actions in office, where he was very far to the right as a campaigner, but shifted to the center and governed very pragmatically, making deals with Democrats that I think that's what really enabled his governorship and and his presidency to be as successful as they were. Absolutely. And that does come out clearly across many different stories. And I do want to talk about those stories and talk about several times in Reagan's life that you dive deeply into in the related themes. Let's start with his service in World War II and how he later characterized it. And I'll notice here, I'm not going to hit everything in his life. And there are many, many aspects of the biography and of Reagan that we're not going to talk about. But I'm going to really focus on the things that struck me as new or really interesting for this contrast of Reagan the man and Reagan, the myth. So talk about his service in World War II, what he actually did and how he later characterized it. Well, his service in World War II was really limited to a back lot in Hollywood in Culver City, California, to be exact, where he was working for the first motion picture unit of the U.S. Army Air Force. And he was, you know, rose to the rank of captain, but he was basically making propaganda and training films a few miles away uh, from his house. Uh, And this was after his studio, Warner Brothers, had used their political connections to win him a number of draft deferments because they wanted him to finish various films that were underway as World War II was breaking out. So he never came close to seeing any action. He was never sent overseas. There was nothing dishonorable about his service. There were a lot of service personnel who, who did not see action and a lot who did not even leave the U.S., But there was certainly nothing heroic about his wartime service either, unlike a lot of his fellow actors, you know, Clark Gable and and Jimmy Stewart and and many others actively sought out service in combat units and went into harm's way. And he he did not do that. And he may not have been able to do that even if he'd wanted to because he had problems with his eyesight. So he, he probably might not have qualified. But there were certainly other privileged people like John F. Kennedy uh, who had horrible back issues, which should have disqualified him from, him from combat service on a PT boat in the Pacific, but he basically pulled strings to get onto that PT boat, and and we know what happened next. Or, you know, George H.W. Bush is one of the youngest aviators in the Navy, desperately trying to get into combat. That wasn't Reagan, and that's fine, but, I mean, it was kind of striking that when he spoke about his wartime experience afterwards, he would write sentences like saying, when I came back from the war, I was, you know, sick of all the killing and desperate to make a better world. And, you know, talking as if he was this grizzled combat veteran 
who had landed at D-Day, which was obviously very far from from the reality. Yeah. Uh, and he, he didn't was, tell any outright lies that I can tell, but right. it was right on the edge of, yeah. you know, spending so much time away from home was hard. And right. it's like, well, you were down the street, really. Yes, yes. Yeah. It wasn't a lie, but it was it kind of gave a deceptive impression. And I think one of the historians I quoted pointed out that he was actually photographed in uniform, probably more than any other 20th century president other than Dwight D. Eisenhower, uh, because the movie magazines had a field day with Ronald Reagan in the army. And and the movie magazines perpetuated this myth as well, talking about they would really, literally write stories about how Reagan was home from the front and things like that. Like the front, that was like, the front was like two miles away from his house. The front of the studio lot. Yes. I mean, <laughs> that's about it. Yeah, it's, it's surprising to me. And it, it does also point out something that I think is lost in the popular conception of Reagan is at least in it, growing up and hearing about him since Reagan, yes, was an actor. That's how he started. But the impression I always had is he was always a B actor at best and sometimes almost a comically bad actor. And what your book reminded me is no, actually there was a brief window where he was in the top tier and, but for a couple of breaks, he, he could have been in Casablanca. He would have been with perhaps one more hit in a perpetual tier, perhaps decades of a listing. Um, but he, he was not a failed actor by any means at that point. I mean, that was actually the cost that World War II exacted on him. And he was never at risk of losing his life. But he basically lost his career to some extent in World War II because, I mean, the bitter irony is that there were actors who were very heroic and sought out combat service, but there were also others like John Wayne, who you know played this uber patriot on the screen, but who dodged the draft entirely. And his career actually took off during World War II because, in part, because all these other actors right. were in uniform and John Wayne wasn't. So he was actually making movies where he was playing you know Marines or soldiers, while his colleagues were actually real soldiers and real Marines. But Reagan, I mean, Reagan was not at either one of those extremes. He was you know, in uniform, in the Air Force, on a Hollywood backlot, but it still interrupted his civilian movie career. He was still making propaganda and training movies. He wasn't getting the starring roles that John Wayne or others were getting. And that, so by the time the war was over, he had lost the traction on his career that he was really gaining when he was kind of joining the A-list in 1940, 1941 with King's Row, his most celebrated movie. And he was actually, I mean, people forget this now, but he was getting equal billing with Errol Flynn in, in Warner Brothers movies right before Pearl Harbor. And that was, he would never achieve that level of movie success in the future. Yeah. The experience of being an actor and being fed the lines, memorizing lines, delivering lines that other people give you. And then of course, much later in life as a politician, many, perhaps most politicians become very good at reading talking points about reading a policy paper and parroting back figures of memorizing what their speech writers have crafted for them, hopefully based on their own ideas. And, and so for Reagan, it seems like the perfect match of here's somebody who is always somebody's spokesperson, right? He, he is always reading a line that somebody else has drafted and he doesn't have an original thought or the ability to put together a speech. But you found out quite differently. After World War II and after his acting career doesn't become sustaining, he starts doing public speaking as a living for a while. Describe his method of developing speeches and delivering speeches and what it reveals about him that's different than what I just described as what many people would assume. Yeah, the, the myth of Reagan is that he was just an actor who was reading lines fed to him by others, as you suggested. But the reality is that he was his own scriptwriter for the first few decades of his public speaking career. When he was speaking on behalf of General Electric in the 1950s, when he was the host of General Electric's show on TV, and he was also a spokesman for General Electric going from plant to plant, giving speeches, which was really his kind of training school as a politician, he didn't have anybody writing those speeches for him. He was doing it himself, and he would you know, write them down on index cards, basically, the salient points he wanted to make. And he was uh, a voracious reader as well. Now, he was also often an indiscriminating reader because he would often read very questionable sources like Human Events or National Review or others and pick up kind of apocryphal stories or not quite true anecdotes. And he would commit those to memory and then write them down as index cards and use them 
for decades afterwards, but he would also, you know, read the LA Times and other more mainstream publications, and he was constantly writing down facts that were of interest to him, arguments, and he would give these speeches where he would basically shuffle his cards and shuffle them into new variations every time, and he would basically test his message, and he would see what worked and what didn't, and he could certainly read an audience, and he knew some audiences soared, others fell flat, so the ones that fell flat that index card would go in the garbage and then he would emphasize the lines that work. So he kind of, in a way, he took a lot of people by surprise uh, when he, well, first off, his introduction to the national political scene in 1964, giving his famous time for choosing speech on behalf of Barry Goldwater, this nationally televised address. And then two years later, he was running for and winning the governorship of California. And, you know, there's not a lot of beginning novice politicians who start in their 50s who are as polished as Reagan was. But the reason he was polished was because he had been practicing this for years, you know, really beginning in post-war Hollywood when he was a labor leader, president of the Screen Actors Guild, then spokesman for General Electric. He gave a ton of speeches all over the country to many, many different audiences. He was also a very polished TV performer. He was, there have been only two U.S. presidents who were hosts of nationally televised shows before becoming president. One, of course, was Donald Trump with The Apprentice, but the other one was was Ronald Reagan uh, in the 1950s with his GE show. So uh, he was a very polished communicator, and it, it wasn't just reading other people's lines. He was really writing his own lines in those days. And in fact, Stu Spencer, his longtime political consultant going back to 1966, told me that Ronald Reagan was the best speechwriter he ever met, in part because... Reagan really wrote sentences for the way that people heard them and listened to them. He wasn't writing for the way that people read them because, of course, his initial job out of college was as a radio broadcaster in Iowa. So he knew how to communicate orally, whether it was on radio, television, or in person, and he was very, very good at it. He knew what what worked with an audience. I really wish that... um to just do a sanity check on your editors at Liverlight, an imprint of W.W. Norton, that you would have put Reagan was one of only two presidents to host a television show before his presidency, you know, along with Rutherford B. Hayes, and just see if they (laughs) caught it. That would have been fun. Um, I mean, there are a couple of shifts in Reagan's life that are important, and that as a biographer, that's gold, right? You get to write about uh, an interesting moment and then how one's trajectory appears to change from it. And you mentioned one there, right? The time to choosing speech, just the idea of going out and giving more political speeches. And then suddenly, you know, within a matter of months, you can almost count on your hands. He's running for governor. And then soon after he's considered a presidential or vice presidential candidate. But another one came before that, which is his internal shift. He was basically a New Deal Democrat. He, he was a fan of FDR, as uh, the majority of Americans were. And even though he didn't appear to have any strong political event that changed him, something in that milieu of Hollywood and blacklisting and his work pattern, suddenly in a matter of years, he goes from seeming like he's still a full fan of New Deal democratic politics to becoming associated with and reading the radical John Birch Society and going out and talking about some very different ideas. I still don't think I understand that turn. What actually happened inside his brain to turn him other than just the momentum of starting to go down that road and letting it carry him? What do you make of that period? And why did Reagan make such a fundamental shift in a relatively short period of time? Well, it takes some unraveling because the account that he himself always gave was completely deceptive because he often said, I didn't leave my party, my party left me. The implication being that he had been kind of a mainstream Democrat and then the Democratic Party went so far to the left that he couldn't stomach that and so he had to become a Republican just to stay in the center. But that is completely inaccurate because in fact, the period of time when he became a conservative and a Republican was the 50s and early 60s and the Democratic Party was very centrist, even conservative in that time. Remember, the leading Democrats in the 50s in Congress were Sam Rayburn and Lyndon Johnson. Their Democratic presidential nominee in 1960 was John F. Kennedy, 
who ran to the right of Richard Nixon on national security. So this was a very hawkish, pro-capitalist, anti-communist party, the party that, in fact, created the containment policy and risked war with the Soviet Union or took the U.S. into war in, in Korea and Vietnam. So this was not some hard left turn by the Democratic Party. In fact, it was a hard right turn by Ronald Reagan, uh, which took him very far from his roots in the 1930s as a very committed and emotional New Dealer whose hero was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And so the issue is, why did he shift to the right? And I think there's, there's a bunch of different you know, forces at play here that I try to unravel in the book. And this was actually one of the most important and, and most difficult mysteries about Reagan to unravel. It, it, I think in some ways it began during World War II when he was very upset at having to pay the extremely high, like 90% wartime tax rates. And of course, he was one of the very few Americans who qualified for those very high tax rates because he made a lot of money as a Hollywood actor. So he was aggrieved about that. He was upset about a lot of the bureaucracy that he encountered in the army, as you would expect in any large organization. But then I think he was really radical, started to become radicalized or shift to the right after World War II in some of the battles over supposed communist subversion in Hollywood when he became a, Reagan became a labor leader and he became drawn into this very bitter dispute between two craft unions in Hollywood that bidding, you know, competing with one another to represent uh, the behind-the-scenes workers on in, in Hollywood movies. And one of them was a very pro-studio, mobbed-up union that was very corrupt. And the other one was this more radical union called the Conference of Studio Unions, led by this former boxer named Herb Sorrell. And so there was this, you know, internecine dispute in Hollywood that he got into the middle of. And the studios and the FBI and a lot of the red baiters in Hollywood, like his good friend, the gossip columnist, Luella Parsons, all accused Herb Sorrell and the Conference of Studio Unions of being communist, of being part of a red attempt to take over Hollywood. And I looked into that very carefully. I really did not find any evidence to support that. I think it was just a, a battle between two different unions, one of whom happened to be a little bit more radical and the other one happened to be a little bit more corrupt. But it was this was cast as this epic good versus evil battle to stop a communist takeover of Hollywood. And Reagan bought it hook, line, and sinker, in part because the FBI told him this was the case. And of course, the FBI was very much in, in, in red baiting, red hunting mode in those days. And so he created this mythology that he had stood up to communists. He had stopped Moscow from taking over Hollywood. He had risked his life. And so that became kind of the foundation of his political evolution. And so by the early 1950s, he was a pretty hardcore anti-communist who, in fact, was integral to the operation of the blacklist in Hollywood, uh, cooperated with the House on American Affairs Committee, cooperated with the FBI, named names. He was, you know, part of this very fraught period in, in Hollywood history, and that moved him to the right on foreign policy and anti-communism. But there were also plenty of, you know, liberal anti-communists, uh, including, of course, Hubert Humphrey and Lyndon Johnson and many others. But he also moved very far to the right on economics and social issues and civil rights and those kinds of issues. And that was really, I think, a process of radicalization that occurred in the 1950s when he was working for GE, which was a very right-wing corporation in those days. Its, its outlook was likened by one of its executives to that of the John Birch Society. And GE went out of its way to proselytize their employees. They really, they gave reading lists. They told, you know, employees to read these right-wing magazines, these right-wing publications, often kind of conspiracy mongering, a warning about, you know, that socialism was coming to America, that every social welfare program was going to be the end of freedom in America. And Reagan had a lot of time to read that literature because he would be taking these, because he, he was afraid of flying in those days, and he would take these cross-country trains from L.A., to New York and Chicago to do these tours for GE. And so he would have, you know, many, many hours to sit there. And of course, this was long before the days when you would be looking at your phone or your TikTok feed or whatever. He was just reading on, on these trains and he was reading a lot of right-wing literature. And as he later said, he basically converted himself to the right. And I think that's essentially what happened because he believed what he read. And also, I think there was kind of an element of he was eager to please. He always wanted to please his bosses or coaches. This is going back to his days in high school and college where his teachers and football coaches found him to be extremely cooperative. He was somebody who would do what he was asked to do. And 
you know, he was eager to please in Hollywood with Jack Warner and Warner, Warner Brothers. And same thing in the 50s. He was eager to please with his GE bosses. And one of the ways he pleased them was by embracing the same very conservative outlook that they had. And I think that was how he wound up. Really, between 1950 and 1960 was the key time because even as late as 1948, he was endorsing Harry Truman. In 1950, he was campaigning against Richard Nixon for the U.S. Senate. But by 1960, he was the head of, of Democrats for Nixon. And you know, the only reason he didn't become a Republican in 1960 was because Dick Nixon personally asked him not to do that because it would be more powerful to have him still be a, a Democrat. It, it's interesting. You raise the issue of him. I don't, it's not being a follower, but it is it is taking the lead from someone in his life. An opportunity presents itself to put it in a positive light. And he goes, well, OK, but it's making people happy, avoiding conflict. And that's not universal, but it's close. I mean, you see it. It's a very strong theme. But it also points to the fact that on a lot of these issues, ranging from those early life experiences to even deciding to help you know, run the, the union in Hollywood, it didn't seem like he had a strong passion to do it. It was more like it came up and somebody said, you should do this. And it's just like either said yes or just started doing it without ever saying yes which previews some of the things in his presidency when there would be policies being discussed and he wouldn't actually make a decision, but people would leave the room and say, well, he seemed to agree with it. So let's do it. It seems like he really stands up to the quote that I found recently from Abraham Lincoln. I attempt no compliment to my own sagacity. I claim not to have controlled events, but confess plainly that events have controlled me. And that kind of felt like what happened in a lot of ways to, to Reagan as opportunities presented themselves and advisors said, well, you know, you really should challenge Gerald Ford for the presidency in 1976. And it's, it's not clear that he sat down and had a rational strategy meeting to decide the pros and cons. He just kind of went into it. And I'm wondering what that revealed to you. you you've studied presidential decision making a lot, especially in foreign policy, and most go through maybe not an Eisenhower level rigor of long strategy meetings and deciding it and getting inputs from everybody. But that really is the NSC process now to very much do that before a decision reaches the president and then get, in the case of a covert action finding, at least a formal presidential signature to do it. Reagan's style was different and it really echoed his experiences in his life, didn't it? Yeah, the way I would put it is that I think Reagan was a great leader and certainly an inspirational leader, but he was a pretty poor manager and he had a lot of trouble sorting out conflicting advice. And that was something that I think became increasingly problematic when he was president, especially in areas where he didn't know a heck of a lot, like, for example, the Middle East. I mean, he studied the Soviet Union and communism for decades, but he knew next to nothing about the Middle East. And his one visit to the region was a very brief trip to Iran in the 1970s. So he had very little information base when dealing with very complicated issues like the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982, which eventually led to this terrible tragedy of U.S. Marines going in there as quote unquote peacekeepers. And in 1983, the terrible bombing of the Marine barracks in Beirut, which killed you know, 241 Marines. Uh, a lot of that was just one mistake after another in part because Reagan was getting very conflicting advice from Secretary of State George Shultz and, and Defense Secretary Cap Weinberger. Those two guys were always, almost always, completely at odds with one another. And Reagan would listen to them, and he didn't know how to sort it out. He would just say, well, you're both my friends. You guys figure it out, basically. And so the result was not making the hard decisions, papering over disagreements, and kind of taking the path of least resistance which sometimes worked, but sometimes led to disaster. And yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of at odds with what the image of Reagan as being like this bold, fearless decision maker who would make the hard calls and would settle difficult issues and confront enemies and so forth. And he sometimes said that for sure. But at other times, you know, he tried to avoid uh, personality conflict. In fact, that was one of the dominant strains in his life. He hated personality conflict, whether it was with family members, his kids, for example, or with AIDS. And so he would often try to basically slide along the surface on this kind of surface amiability, where he would 
make everybody feel good with his quips and jokes and very charismatic guy. He certainly knew how to, you know, touch a chord in anybody he spoke with. But, you know, often when he was doing that, he was actually evading kind of the hard decisions, not make, not really making the hard call. And so the result was, as, as you said, his aides would often leave cabinet meetings or they would leave, you know, National Security Council meetings or leave the Oval Office. And they would have different ideas about what he had decided because he would kind of give everybody the the impression that he agreed with them, even when their advice was diametrically at odds. And so you had this, after the Marine barracks bombing in 83, there was this endless dispute over whether the U.S. was going to retaliate by bombing these Iranian military against the installations in the Bekaa Valley, where apparently the bombing had been planned. And George Shultz was convinced, and Bud McFarlane, they were both convinced that Reagan had agreed in a meeting to bomb those installations. But Cap Weinberger, the defense secretary, was opposed to doing that. And he was convinced that Reagan never gave the execute order. So he never actually did it. And then for years afterwards, Bud McFarlane claimed that Cap Weinberger had subverted the president's will and had flatly refused to do what the president had ordered. In fact, as when I looked into it, there wasn't any indication that the president actually ordered this. I mean, he, he may have given Bud McFarlane the impression that he was sympathetic to Bud's view, but he didn't sign that order. So, you know, he did not have that kind of Eisenhower-like rigor about mm-hmm. reaching decisions. And sometimes it worked out, sometimes it didn't. And then it's interesting to contrast the the first term and the second term in that regard, because on the one hand, Reagan is getting, if anything, more distant from decision making. He's a little less focused. You know, there's still dispute over how much he was impaired in the last year or so of his presidency. But even if you put that aside, he certainly was engaging even less. But in the first term, you had the Al Hags and the Allens and Clarks and McFarlands and everybody fighting, manipulating, taking things out of meetings they could. And I love the contrast with the closing year or so of the presidency when Frank Carlucci noted, so he he had become Secretary of Defense replacing Cap Weinberger, and he noted that he and George Schultz, the Secretary of State, and Colin Powell, who had succeeded Carlucci as National Security Advisor, every morning they would get together at seven o'clock and they would decide on every foreign policy issue what the three of them could agree on. And Carlucci noted there were times when he strongly disagreed with something, but he would change his position or Schultz would change his position so that they could go to Ronald Reagan with a a unanimous uh, recommendation. And Colin Powell would simply brief him and say, sir, this is what we're doing if you have no objections. And invariably, he would have no objections. It would keep the issues off his desk and reduce the cognitive load, if you will, on the president. But I don't think that's an issue about mental impairment because it goes back to Reagan's strategy for decision making through most of his life, which is, you know, if there's an easy path in front of me, I'll just take it and I will avoid personal conflict at almost any cost. I think that's right. I think there was impairment towards the end of his presidency, not necessarily caused by Alzheimer's, but just caused by aging, because this is a guy who was in his late 70s. And and we've seen today what it's like to have a president in his late 70s. They're just not as sharp as, as they once were. And so, yeah, he was he was happy not to have to sort out these disagreements. And, you know, Schultz, Carlucci, and Powell figured out that uh, it was better for everybody if they would just sort it out among themselves. But I think that, but there was, I think there was a, this was kind of a constant theme throughout Reagan's time in government, whether he was governor of California or president, that he was most successful when he had the best aides working for him. And he was much more dependent upon his aides than a lot of other presidents who are much more hands-on and who are themselves involved in the nitty-gritty of of policymaking. Reagan was not. He would kind of set the broad vision in his speeches, and he would expect people to go out and execute. But sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. So he was it was really at the mercy of his aides. And certainly during the first term as president, there was a massive amount of backbiting and disputes and leaking and bureaucratic politics in the White House because of this unwieldy triumvirate of Jim Baker, Ed Meese, and Mike Deaver, who were the top three aides in the White House. But it was actually also a pretty successful period, largely because Jim Baker emerged as the dominant personality in the Troika. And Jim Baker was not only 
one of the most effective White House chiefs of staff in history, maybe the most effective White House chief of staff in history. He was actually kind of, I, I argue in the book, he was kind of more than that. He was almost like the prime minister. He was really running a huge chunk of the government and he couldn't make like national security decisions for the president. And Reagan reserved those for himself generally. But on domestic policy, Jim Baker easily outranked any cabinet member. His decisions could really could not, could seldom be appealed. So Reagan was very lucky. And, and it wasn't just luck because he picked Jim Baker, which was very unexpected. And that was, mm-hmm. in many ways, the most important decision of his entire presidency to pick this guy who had worked against him to be his White House chief of staff. And so that made the first term pretty effective. The second term was a disaster early on because of this job switch that, that Jim Baker negotiated with Don Regan, the Treasury Secretary, where they decided it would be nice if they switched jobs. And again, to show you how passive Reagan was, they cooked this up between themselves, Jim Baker and Ed Meese did, or Jim Baker and Don Regan did, and they took it into the president, and he kind of signed off in a half an hour meeting in the Oval Office without asking a lot of questions, basically like, well, if you fellows think this is a good idea, sounds good to me. I mean, this was a hugely consequential decision because Don Regan turned out to be a horrible White House chief of staff. As, as Jim Baker said to me, Don's problem was that he liked the chief part of the title, but he didn't understand that he was staff. So he was like this former you know, Merrill Lynch CEO who thought he was going to be the CEO of, of Washington as well, but had horrible political instincts. And the result was the Iran-Contra affair and, and various lesser uh, disasters. So Reagan was really in trouble while Don Regan was in charge. And then in the height of the Iran-Contra affair, Nancy Reagan finally persuaded the president to fire Don Regan, which he hated to do. Reagan hated to fire anybody, and but he finally was persuaded to, to get rid of Don Regan and bring in Howard Baker to study the ship. And then Howard Baker and then his deputy and successor, Ken Duberstein, really imposed order and discipline and good decision-making at the White House. And so that's what really rescued you know, the final couple of years of the Reagan presidency was once again having a chief of staff that he could rely upon. And it's especially ironic that you have a Jim Baker playing that role as somebody who had no personal connection to the president. He was friends with his political opponent in 1980, George H.W. Bush. And Reagan didn't yeah. really have anybody that was the true Reagan whisperer. Even Reagan himself probably did not understand Ronald Reagan. Nancy probably understood him better than he did, but obviously she was not going to have a formal role as chief of staff and operating the machinery of government, even though I think it's arguable that she had more influence on his decision-making and certainly his pattern of decision-making than anyone else. If there had been no Jim Baker, I mean, we can run the counterfactual in our head and look at everyone else who was around, whether it was the Devers or the Hagues or the Reagan presidency could have turned out very, very differently with just that one factor different. Absolutely. And that's that's why I say, you know, choosing Jim Baker was in many ways the most important decision of his presidency. And some of the people that, that Jim Baker clashed with, like Bill Clark, the national security advisor, they complained, I think, with some justice that the real troika it was not Meese, Baker, and Deaver. The real, the real troika was Nancy Reagan, Jim Baker, and Mike Deaver. Those were really the people who were running the government in the White House because, you know, Baker was was in charge of most things, and he was backed up by Nancy and Mike Deaver, who were the ones who had the closest relationship with the president, the personal closest personal relationship with the president. I want to get back to image again now that we're in the presidency. So Reagan wasn't quite at the Charlton Heston level of doing one-armed push-ups on a stage while he was president. But for a man of his age, he was in pretty good shape, right? He would do the horseback riding. He would go and clear the ranch. And he probably was, he certainly presented himself as one of the more fit presidents. At the same time, in the early 80s, there was a dramatic shift in pop culture relating to national security. You had had for years movies like Apocalypse Now and The Deer Hunter, you know, very dark on the military experience and how corrupting and evil it is, or the bumbling military like Stripes or uh, Private Benjamin and others like that. Um, And a lot of that is, of course, mixed in with feelings about Vietnam and um, America's role. But then that shift happens. Sometime around 82, 83, you really notice it. And it's taken time for Reagan 
to really use that image as president. And it's taken time for Hollywood to start producing films that they probably were green lighting years earlier. But suddenly you're getting Rambo and you're getting Top Gun. And Rambo is dark too, yes. But it still shows an image of almost jingoistic, right? American heroism. Top Gun is in that category. You get to Iron Eagle and all of these others. When you looked at this, you're not doing a cultural history. You're doing a biography of Reagan, but you can't help but notice this, that in the in a very short period of time, there is that shift from America dark, reflecting negatively upon itself and its role in the world to America strong and proud. How did you think through that and see that through what Reagan did and how he was perceived in that first term? Well, in some ways, I think this was actually Reagan's most important achievement, because if you look at other things for which he is credited, I mean, if you look at the economic recovery, for example, a lot of that, to be honest, was really Paul Volcker, the Fed chairman, who took inflation out of the economy. If you look at the end of the Cold War, for which he is, again, often credited, a lot of that was Mikhail Gorbachev and the changes he wrought in the Soviet Union. But the improvement in American morale, the lifting of America's spirits, the recovery from the dark days of the 1970s, that was really where I think Ronald Reagan played a central role because of his sunny, optimistic nature his and his unfeigned faith in America as a shining city on a hill, his, his patriotism, all these. That was really where the values he learned growing up in the small town Midwest in the 19 teens and 20s. That's really where it paid off because he was there was not a cynical bone in Ronald Reagan's body. And he sincerely believed in in the goodness of America. Now, as I point out, he often kind of glossed over some of the darker and more disreputable episodes in American history. Mm -hmm. The whole, you know, the terrible denial of civil rights to African Americans, for example, but he had a very optimistic outlook on the world, which went back to his earliest days, really, really taught by his, his mother, Nellie, to always look on the sunny side of life. And she was this inveterate optimist, very religious woman who imbued him in this faith that everything would work out for the best. And that was kind of the secret of his political success, I would argue. And in fact, I suggest in the book that in, in, in that respect, he was very similar to his boyhood hero, FDR because they were both imbued with this incredible sunniness, this optimism, this faith that everything would work out. And they were able to project that faith onto the entire country and to bring the country out of some very dark times, in part through the strength of their own character, the strength of their own belief and their, and their ability to communicate those beliefs. And so I think what Reagan did on the, in, the, in his first term was very important because he really helped America to recover from Watergate, from the de defeat in Vietnam, from stagflation, from the Iran hostage crisis, all these disasters of the 1970s. And there, there was kind of a sense that Jimmy Carter was kind of dour. He was a downer, you know. He was lecturing people instead of inspiring them. And Reagan came in and he kind of restored this flag-waving extravaganzas to the White House and made that a center mark of his presidency. And he really helped to restore morale in the military, which I think was very important, which had fallen, you know, from the 1970s. But I think he also helped to inspire kind of confidence in the country at large. And I think that was a real achievement. That was where his communications ability and his, and his sunniness really paid off. What I liked in your book, Max, was how you write about the optimism and, you know, always look on the sunny side. But it really pairs well with the pragmatism. And you don't always think of those two as going together in life, but they really do. And that came out, I think it was back, I'm trying to remember now, but there was a quote you included from probably his first, when he was first governor in, in California, where he was making compromises. He was doing things different than people thought he would. But his quote was something like, I'm willing to take what I can get and go out and get some more next year. And that pragmatism, right? I need to reach a, a bargain now. I need to compromise to get 80% or 50% of what I want, but I'll go out and get more next year. That's where the pragmatism meets the optimism. It's okay to compromise because things will work out in the end. Yeah. And, and Stu Spencer, who knew him very well, the way Stu explained it to me was that this was really this Midwestern ethic that he learned as a young man in the Midwest. That's actually one of the keys to Ronald Reagan, because we, we of course, think of him as a Californian 
and as a Westerner, but he didn't move out to California until he was something like 27 years old. So he really was formed by the Midwest, by kind of Main Street USA. That's the way kind of Stu explained it. That's kind of the fundamental pragmatism of a farmer who wants to get $20 a bushel for his grain, can only get 15 or 10 and says, okay, well, I'll take it and, and hope for, you know, a better payday in the future. That was very much Ronald Reagan, you know, growing up not only with that faith in America, but also with that fundamental pragmatism. And he had, and, and very interesting to see how Reagan had nothing but contempt for conservatives who go over the cliff with their flags flying, which was the way that he put it. That's a quote. Uh, because he was often criticized for compromising and he kind of brushed it off because he said that's, you know, that's the nature of politics. You have to be realistic about what you can get. And if you're an absolutist, you're not going to get anything done. And that's, you know, that's very different from uh, a lot of what you hear from Reagan's successors in the Republican Party today who view uh, compromise as a synonym for betrayal. You mentioned something in there that uh, makes me want to go back in time because I think people need to hear that. I certainly had forgotten it from earlier biographies, but Reagan did get the idea in high school and into college that it'd be fun to go to Hollywood and be an actor. But he found an actual, for, for the times, the Depression era, he was doing really well in the Midwest doing broadcasting, making salaries that were allowing him as a very young man to support his family and live much better than probably the top 5% of, of Americans at that time in that area. Yeah. And yet he found an opportunity <laughs> to get to Hollywood and stay there. So what, what opportunity came up that allowed him the chance to visit Southern California? And, and how did he translate that into acting? Well, one of the myths of Reagan, which he propagated himself, was that he never had any kind of personal ego or ambition, that this opportunities just kind of fell in his lap and he felt compelled to take advantage of them because that's what people asked him to do. And, you know, I will say that he was less egotistical than a lot of people who become president of the United States, but and certainly more self-effacing. But underneath the surface, there was this kind of burning ambition to succeed where, you know, he told his fraternity brothers at Eureka College that within a few years, he'd be making $5,000 a year, which was big money at, at the height of the Great Depression. Uh, so he was not satisfied with kind of settling down in his hometown and living this quiet, uneventful life. He did have these ambitions of going to Hollywood. He didn't know how to get there from you know, Dixon, Illinois, at the height of the Great Depression. But what he figured out was that working at a radio station could be getting his foot into the door of showbiz because there was not a single movie studio anywhere in Illinois, but there were a lot of radio stations around. So he got a job at a small radio station in Downport, Iowa, and then did such a good job there that he very quickly got moved to a larger station in Des Moines. And he became the voice of the Chicago Cubs throughout the Midwest known as Dutch Reagan, became a very well-known sportscaster. And then he got the bright idea of asking the station owner to send them with the Cubs on their spring training to Catalina Island off the coast of California. Brilliant. And lo and behold, Catalina Island is pretty close to Hollywood, yeah. pretty close to where the movie studios were located. And so <laughs> he was basically, he was kind of sneakily ambitious because while ostensibly out in Catalina Island just to cover the Cubs, he snuck away and did a screen test with Warner Brothers. And that's how his Hollywood career began. That's a great example to counter the earlier idea I had of him just being carried away by whatever came to him. That one, he seems to have engineered it pretty well himself. So, okay, back to the presidency. You, you have read and written quite a bit about Reagan's presidency before. Having looked at all of this, having put his presidency and especially his foreign policy uh, into the context of his overall life. Did you look a little bit differently in particular at the relationship with the Soviet Union and what ultimately became the end of the Cold War? Absolutely, uh, because before uh, starting the research on this project, I you know tended to credit kind of the popular conservative story that Reagan had a plan to bring down the evil empire and that's what he did. He brought down the evil empire into the, the Cold War. But as I got deeper and deeper into the research for this and, and learned more and more, it very quickly became apparent to me that that was a complete oversimplification and, and, and not accurate at all. In fact, I asked 
George Schultz that very question. I said, hey, did you have a secret plan to, to win the Cold War? And he said, well, I wish we did, but we didn't. Uh, we had a general attitude of peace through strength, but we certainly didn't have any idea that we were going to bring down the Soviet Union. And the reality is, if Mikhail Gorbachev had not become general secretary of the Communist Party in 1985, the Soviet Union might still exist. And that's not a very far-fetched concept, because in some ways, Putin has revived the Soviet Union, at least within, within Russia itself. So there wasn't anything inevitable about the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I don't think it was caused by Reagan's defense buildup or his aid to freedom fighters in Afghanistan or Nicaragua or whatever. He did a lot of things that, that put pressure on the Soviet Union, for sure. But he also did a lot of things that took pressure off the Soviet Union, which his admirers often forget. For example, when he came in in 1981, he lifted the grain embargo that Carter had imposed after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and after the imposition of martial law in Poland in December of 1981. Reagan briefly imposed sanctions on the Siberian gas pipeline from the Soviet Union to Western Europe. And then he lifted the sanctions within less than a year because European allies were not very happy about it. So it's a gross oversimplification to say that he declared economic warfare on the Soviet Union or he had a plan to bring down the Soviet Union. That's not really the case. He did have a lot of hardline policies in the first term, but they weren't getting him very far because he was dealing with these implacable apparatchiks like Brezhnev and Dropov and Chernenko who were not going to compromise with him. His policy with the Soviet Union only became a great success and helped to end the Cold War because Gorbachev came into office in 85. And Gorbachev was a very different kind of communist leader who was determined to relax the communist dictatorship. He wanted to end the Cold War. He wanted to spend more on the civilian sector of the economy. And he wasn't doing that because he thought he was losing an arms race. He didn't want to be in an arms race in the first place. And that really came from his own experience, having lost faith in the Soviet system, even as he was rising up within that, that very system. So, you know, my conclusion was that Reagan was not really responsible for Gorbachev coming to power. He was not responsible for Gorbachev reforms. And it was really Gorbachev's reforms that led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. But what Reagan was responsible for, and this is back to his pragmatic streak, he was responsible for recognizing that Gorbachev was somebody he could do business with, as Margaret Thatcher told him. He recognized that Gorbachev was not just another hardline communist who was out to defeat the West, which is what a lot of people, including Cap Weinberger and Robert Gates and many others, they believed that to the end of the Reagan presidency. But Reagan did not because he met Gorbachev in Geneva in 1985, and he concluded that Gorbachev was somebody he could work with. And in fact, his Reagan's great achievement was to work with Gorbachev to peacefully end the Cold War. That's a monumental achievement, but it was really based not on confrontation with the Soviet Union, but on cooperation, which is completely different from the mythology you get from, for example, this new Reagan movie or, or other sources of this Reagan legend. That's not what actually happened. And I think that it's a little older than that because it has set root in what I'll call the younger generation, which we can now say as wizened old men. But when I, when I teach, I've taught undergrads, I've taught graduate students, when we talk about Reagan, unless they are really immersed in American political history and they've studied it, and we connect it to the Cold War, the general thought, not universal, but the general thought is Reagan built up the military, was tough on the Soviets, made it clear that they weren't going to win. And then George Bush was the pragmatist who ended the Cold War without a shot. And there are elements of truth in parts of those, but it doesn't really hold up as a as a unifying narrative there. It's more like, well, yes, there, there were some things that were done in the 1980s that brought America back, but some of that was started under Jimmy Carter in terms of military buildup. But Reagan himself was the pragmatist who set the stage for the end of the Cold War. And yes, it could have turned out differently if someone other than Bush 41 followed him, somebody who wanted to rub the Russians nose in it instead of finding a peaceful landing for the post-Soviet states. But it's amazing how that narrative really has taken hold among generally educated people that Reagan was the tough cold warrior who forced the Soviet Union into submission and Bush saved it at the end. Yeah, that's the legend of Ronald Reagan. That's not the life. And I, as, yeah. as we were discussing the reality, 
is very different and, and more interesting and in many ways more flattering to Reagan. But this is the legend that has been propagated over many decades. One other thing I want to address uh, about Reagan, and this doesn't come out as much in your book, but I'm struck by the contrast, and there are many reasons for it, but I'm struck by the contrast between the post-presidency of Richard Nixon and the post-presidency of Ronald Reagan. And of course, there are also strong contrasts with the post-presidencies of Carter and others, but I focus on Nixon and Reagan because they are similar in certain ways that make the comparison interesting. You know, both California, both grew up poor, both ended up right wing in some ways, but in some policies, not so much. Nixon as a post-president never stopped. He was writing letters to every successor of his. He was having meetings with many of them. He was going on foreign trips. I mean, and Reagan himself. Including Reagan. He was a constant fond of advice to Reagan. Now, whether Reagan always wanted it or appreciated it, we can't tell. We can't get into Reagan's head. But Nixon was a presence for everyone, whether they wanted it or not. And he was still flying around talking to world leaders. Reagan, obviously, at an older age when he left the presidency, in U.S. domestic politics, he basically walked away. Sure, he went and gave some speeches in Japan and made a lot of money. Sure, he spoke at a convention. and But he was not playing the role in American political life that almost any other president has in modern times. And I'm wondering what you think about that contrast. And can we attribute all of that to to his age and condition? Or do you think that's part of who Ronald Reagan was, that he did his bit, he played his role, and he really just wanted to relax on the range? I think that's exactly right. I think both elements come into play. And remember, his post-presidency was, was tragically cut short because he left the presidency in 1989. And in 1994, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So he didn't have a long time to really be active as post-president. But you're right. He had no desire to basically stay in the limelight. And I think that's actually one of the most appealing and attractive qualities of Ronald Reagan was that he was, although he had a healthy ambition for sure, he was not an egomaniac. He was not somebody even who sought the spotlight at all costs, in part because he had been in the spotlight since his late 20s. He didn't feel compelled that he had to go out and grab it. And, and w- with some presidents, and it's like Nixon and Carter, really, I think there was a sense that they needed to be very active post-presidency to redeem the failures of their presidency. But of course, Reagan viewed himself, and I think most people viewed his presidency as being a success. So he didn't have a lot to prove after the presidency. And in fact, he looked more and more successful as time went by with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Union, America's emergence as the one great power in the world. So you know, he was happy to bask in accolades, but he didn't go out and seek them. And he didn't really care about things like the Ronald Reagan Library, which was really Nancy Reagan's initiative. He didn't really care. Subsequently, Reagan admirers started renaming everything after Ronald Reagan, including, you know, the airport in Washington and many other things. And Mm -hmm. that wasn't something that he was seeking. He didn't really care much one way or the other, because at the end of the day, he was very secure in who he was. And one of the fascinating insights I got on Reagan was, I think Stu Spencer told me, he would have made a pretty good hermit, although he was somebody who who enjoyed, you know, applause and the limelight as anybody does. He was actually pretty happy just to go home, eat his dinner in front of the TV and watch, you know, Mission Impossible or Bonanza or Murder, She Wrote or something else. Mm-hmm. He wasn't addicted to the applause of crowds. He wasn't addicted to the media spotlight. He was perfectly happy to give it all up and go chop wood at his ranch. Yeah. Um, briefly about his his movies, I'm assuming you watched all or the vast majority of his films as part of your research. Yeah, I can't. I mean, I think he made like 54 feature films, so I cannot claim I saw every single one, but I saw most of them and certainly all the notable ones. Okay, so most Americans have not. And I would bet that even when he was running for president, most Americans did not go back and watch them because the technology didn't make it easy back then. But right. from the relatively early ones, the you know Secret Service of the Air and the Code of the Secret Service when he was playing the, the young agent who was doing well. Ross Bancroft, yeah, Secret Service agent. Through Hell's Kitchen and King's Row. Those, those by, by the way, were super cheesy and difficult to watch movies because <laughs> those were B pictures even in Hollywood in the 30s. And Most of those of the era were, but you're saying yeah, I mean, this, were even... like the special effects, the production quality. Yeah. It was really agonizing for people who are used to like the digital graphics of today. 
but then he ends up doing, you know, Newt Rockne, All American, Santa Fe Trail, and you mentioned yeah. King's Row already before later. If you go to 100 Americans and ask what movie was Ronald Reagan in, the vast majority, if they can name one, will name Bedtime for Bonzo, yeah. and that's it. And, which, and very interesting that Reagan, as I noted, his ego was firmly in check in politics, and he didn't really mind being attacked for his political positions. Nancy Reagan minded, Ronald did not. But Ronald Reagan hated to be criticized for his acting ability because he was very proud of his acting ability, and he did not like people like scoffing at him, making fun of Bedtime for Bonzo or some of these other movies. Right. So clearly Bedtime for Bonzo was not his top or top five. It was actually, I got to say, I did. I have watched Bedtime for Bonzo. It's actually a perfectly pleasant and entertaining movie. It's not like one of the great movies of all time. Right. But I found it much easier to watch than like the Brass Bancroft movies, which were just cheesy and low rent. Bedtime for Bonzo is actually kind of this very light romantic comedy, which is actually, this is the this is another one of these things I discovered because there's this mythology of Reagan as the cowboy. And so people assume he must have been in a million Westerns. In fact, I think he was in five Western movies throughout his entire career. That was actually a sore point for him because he wanted to be cast in Westerns. He wanted to be Gary Cooper. He wanted to be John Wayne. He wanted to be one of these, you know, swashbuckling gunslingers of the Wild West, but that's not actually who he was. And Jack Warner and his bosses realized he just did not project that kind of charisma and danger. You needed to be a Western action hero. Yeah. He was actually a super nice guy who played best in light romantic comedies like Bedtime for Bonzo. So those are actually his most enjoyable movies. That's what he was best at. For those classic Westerns, you need grit, right? Not the nice guy persona. Yes, he did not have grit. Yes. So other than Bedtime for Bonzo, of the movies you watched, what are the one or two that you say, yeah, people should watch this either because it's a good movie, which is possible, or because Reagan's role in it was interesting? Yeah. Well, I think that the two that are his iconic roles, Newt Rockne, All-American, or he played George Gipp, the Notre Dame football star who died tragically young, uh, and then King's Row, the melodrama about sordid goings on in, in the small town Midwest, which was the same milieu that he came from. Those were his best acting jobs and those were his his iconic roles. And again, some of his movies completely unwatchable now, like Love is on the Air, his first one in Hollywood, or the Brass Bancroft movies, terrible. But, uh, you know, Newt Rockne, All-American and King's Row are, are still, I found, pretty entertaining. I found Bedtime for Bonzo. Uh, there was one where he played... Uh, Grover Cleveland Alexander, the great pitcher, which was also, I thought, pretty entertaining. And he enjoyed doing it because he loved playing sports. You know, I think there's a, there's a myth about what a terrible actor he was. He really wasn't. He was, he was actually a pretty decent professional actor. He was certainly not one of the all-time screen greats, but he was pretty confident within his range. And that, that was kind of the issue with him was he had a somewhat narrow range because essentially... He wanted to be Ronald Reagan on the screen. He did not want to play roles that made him look bad. So he had trouble giving the depth of characterization that you needed for more complex characters. And he certainly, I think in his entire career, he only played a villain once, and that was a complete disaster. He just didn't have it in him because he was just a nice guy. He wanted to play nice guys on the screen, and sometimes that worked, but it limited his range and limited his prospects in Hollywood at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, now I'm going to put you on the spot because... There's a question that occurs to me. It occurred to me when I was trying to write about Reagan um, and, and many, many others. But I'm going to ask you to come up with a question that if you had the chance to interview Ronald Reagan for this book, like any good biographer, you would have 10 years worth of questions, literally thousands of questions. But what's one fact or one reflection above the others that you would want to ask Ronald Reagan himself? Oh, man, that's really difficult because the problem with Reagan, as you know, is that he was a terrible interview subject and he drove interviewers like Edmund Morris, his authorized biographer, to distraction. I mean, Edmund arguably went, went mad trying to interview Ronald Reagan because Reagan had absolutely no self-reflection <laughs> and he was incapable of giving a thoughtful answer about himself. He would just go back to the same time-worn anecdotes and stories. 
in one-liners that he had been repeating for decades. So yeah, so you're thinking about what can you actually get insight or information from given that, and that narrows the range quite a bit. Exactly. So that's a huge challenge. I can't really think of any question that I could ask Ronald Reagan that would probably tell me something I didn't know because people like Edmund Morris tried and tried and tried, and they really didn't get anywhere because yeah. he just did not have that that ability to be self-reflective, which is made, which is I think part of what has made him such a challenging subject for biographers. And that's what with Edmund Morris, you know, he inserted himself as a fictional character in Reagan's life, which was a crazy, crazy decision. Yeah. But it, I, I think, in some ways, and I talked to Edmund, who, who died recently, but Edmund, I think, was just kind of driven to distraction by Reagan's inability to get beneath the surface of his own life. Yeah. I'm with you. I think it would be a frustrating experience, very limited returns, and you'd have to choose your question carefully. It couldn't be something like, you know, in in August of 1981, when you made this decision, what were you thinking? No, that's not going to work. And it can't be, you know, if you had selected Jim Baker for national security advisor instead of, no, the counterfactuals probably don't work either. It's probably more like, you know, what did you like about Errol Flynn as an actor? Or, yeah. you know, what movie would you really have loved to be in? Something like that, you might yeah. get something out of him, but of course, yeah. that's not going to be compelling for the core issues of the biography. The irony is from having read all of Reagan's letters and diaries and all the rest of it, I can actually answer questions like that because got those. he was actually, I think, most self-revealing in writing letters, not in speaking, but in writing letters, right. he actually gave a, an account of of you know, Errol Strink's right. uh, weaknesses and his attractiveness as, as an actor, but also his weaknesses. So I actually know what you nailed that, what, what Reagan thought about Errol Flynn. But so the challenge is to find out, ask him something he hasn't already said that he would offer new insights about. And, oh, man, that would be a huge challenge. I mean, I would have loved to have been able to do that, but right. I don't have a lot of confidence I would have gotten anything new out of him. Yeah. All right. I went to the grave site, but he wasn't talking, so yep. I got nothing out of him. Now's the time in uh, the podcast when we reach into the chatterbox and pull out a random question for you. Max, recommend any recent book you've read, podcast you've listened to, or TV show you've watched, something that you think people would get something out of? Good question. Well, you know, I'm reading two books right now, both of which I like. Mm-hmm. One is The Great Unwinding by George Packer, which I think is really a masterpiece of nonfiction where Packer really writes almost novelistically about what's happened to America in the last 20 or 30 years with the loss of industry, mm-hmm. the, the huge economic changes, how these things affect individuals. And he tells the story through a series of lives. Uh, so I think it's a very compelling portrait of how 21st century America got the way it is. And it's, it's just a brilliant read, I think. The other thing I'm reading, which is a lot lighter, uh, is My Secret Addiction, which is that I am addicted to Mike O'Connolly books. I love the Harry Bosch books. Uh, I'm reading a Rene Ballard book right now. I think uh, Connolly is a brilliant crime writer who I think was inspired by one of my favorite authors, Raymond Chandler, and kind of updated the Raymond Chandler PI and LA genre for, for a modern era. And I think they're actually terrific reads, but also... The problem I often have with thrillers or crime novels or what have you is I often throw them down in disgust because they take such an unrealistic turn. They're so crazy. And I want things to be at least believable. And that's, I think, where Connolly really shines, because although there's no detective in the world that would solve all these cases that Harry Bosch solves, but each individual one actually reads uh, pretty realistically and pretty believably. You can imagine that these things actually happen to somebody. And so that's kind of my my secret vice is Michael Connolly. Well, I will put links to those in the show notes so people can uh, see if they share your passion for those things. Um, but of course, I will also link to the massive but massively worthwhile new book, Reagan, His Life and Legend. Uh, Max, Thanks for spending so much time chatting with me about it. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Really interesting, in-depth conversation. Enjoyed it. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast 
and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter.